Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Phil DiStefano, Chancellor here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Case Building and to see you Boulder. And I wanna thank the Steamboat Institute and the Benson Center for the study of Western civilization for hosting today's debate on a, an important topic that affects all of us. Universities like CU Boulder are unique in their ability to bring together diverse viewpoints and create opportunities for robust discussions about society's biggest challenges. Encouraging free and open debate, grounded in honesty and respect for one another, is a core feature of the university and is one of the ways that higher education is called to support and sustain democracy itself. So I applaud each of you for attending this afternoon and for opening up your minds to the learning and growth that can happen when we exchange perspectives. We have some excellent panelists with us tonight who will be introduced in just a moment. So thank you all for joining us. And now it's my pleasure, Jennifer, I think to, or Taylor, I'm sorry, uh, to welcome you. But let me say a couple words about Jennifer uh, Schubert Aiken, who's chair and CEO of the Steamboat Institute. Uh, in, in addition to her role with the Steamboat Institute, Jennifer serves on the advisory board of CU Boulder's Benson Center, whose mission is to promote the study uh, of the intellectual, artistic, and political traditions that characterize Western civilization. So Jennifer, thank you. And Taylor, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Taylor Jaworski. I'm an associate professor of economics um, and the associate faculty director of the Benson Center for Western Civilization here at the University of Colorado Boulder. The goals of the Benson Center, uh, where I'm the faculty director, are twofold. First, as the chancellor said, to promote the study of Western civilization. And second, to promote intellectual and ideological diversity on campus and beyond. In pursuit of those goals, tonight's event will be a debate on an important issue of public policy that touches every country in the world, um, and I think is in particular important uh, uh, today in this country. Um, I'm going to I'm going to let Jennifer uh, talk about how tonight's event will go, but I, I do want to kind of reiterate uh, some of the chancellor's remarks. Jennifer uh, Schubert Aiken uh, has been. Uh, a great supporter of the Benson Center. She's on our advisory committee um, and helps us navigate um, you know, troubled waters uh, um, here and there. Um, and so I wanna thank her very much for that. Um, she is the CEO and chairman of the Steamboat uh, Institute, uh, or an organization she founded in 2008. Um, and so with that, let me welcome Jennifer Schubert Aiken. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you, Chancellor DiStefano. Um, I'm short, so I'll lean in a little bit, make sure all of you can hear me. It's really good to be here in Boulder because back home in Steamboat, we still have three feet of snow where normally we have daffodils blooming in the spring. So uh, glad, glad to be uh, down here where uh, there's a little less snow. Um, I would, uh, it's really a pleasure to serve with Taylor on the Benson Center Advisory Board. Um, I'd also like to really say a special thank you to Chancellor DiStefano for his warm welcome to the CU campus and for his commitment to free and open inquiry and debate. Um, when we visit campuses across America with these debates, I'm always proud to mention CU and the Benson Center as shining examples of a place where students and faculty can engage in free and open inquiry and expression without fear of being shamed or intimidated into silence, and that is very important. The resolution being debated tonight is a critical one that affects the lives of millions of people. That resolution is illegal crossings of the US-Mexico border are increasing at record levels. The US government must secure the border immediately. We invite all of our audience members, both those with us in person here in Boulder and hundreds more who are watching online from across America to respond with your view on this resolution, agree, disagree, or undecided before the debate begins using the link that was provided to you by text and email. We will then ask your opinion again after the debate is over to see if your opinions have changed. 
But be before we begin this evening's debate, I would like to tell you more about Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates just briefly so you will understand what this is all about. We started this debate series in April of 2018 right here in Boulder with a debate featuring Nigel Farage and Vicente Fox debating nationalism versus globalism. It drew nearly a thousand people to Mackey Auditorium on the night when it was the NCAA men's basketball championship finals. Um, some of our previous debates have featured Jason Riley and Donna Brazil debating social justice and identity politics. That was also here in Boulder. We uh, have had Charles Payne of Fox Business and Bakari Sellers of CNN debating free enterprise versus government programs at the University of Texas in Austin. And just last month, we had Professor Stephen Coonan of NYU and Rob so Sokolow of Princeton debating climate change at Cornell. And that was a really fascinating debate. You can watch these and any of our previous debates from the last five years in their entirety on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. We are also planning a full schedule of Campus Liberty Tour debates for the 2023-24 academic year on campuses all over the country. You can sign up for email alerts at steamboatinstitute.org or of course follow us on social media platforms to get the latest, update, uh, latest updates and stay informed on those upcoming debates. The demand for our Campus Liberty Tour debates is exploding as a sea change is happening on college campuses across the country. With the rise of groups such as Speech First, the Alumni Free Speech Alliance, and Heterodox Academy, cancel culture is being replaced by a challenge culture of free and open inquiry and debate. Steamboat Institute is at the epicenter of this sea change with our emphasis on teaching students and all who attend how to think, not what to think. You are always welcome at a Steamboat Institute debate, regardless of your opinion on the issues, as long as you're willing to engage in civilized discourse with respect for differing points of view. We applaud our four debaters for participating in this debate tonight. Steamboat Institute will continue to give both sides of critical issues a fair and balanced platform to make their case because folks, we can't maintain our democratic republic without citizens and leaders who are capable of civilized debate and critical thinking. As a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute depends on the generous support of many individuals, businesses, and foundations to bring you thought-provoking programs such as today's debate. I would like to say a special thank you to the Adolph Coors Foundation for their generous support, which is allowing us to expand our Campus Liberty Tour program to more campuses across America. I would also like to thank the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, and the Snyder Foundation for their generous support of Steamboat Institute's programs. And finally, I would like to say a very special thank you to Bruce and Marcy Benson, not only for their financial support, but also for their vision in founding the Benson Center and making a bold statement to restore diversity of ideas and free speech at CU Boulder. In addition to our Campus Liberty Tour debates, Steamboat Institute will be hosting our 15th annual Freedom Conference at the Beaver Creek Resort near Vail, August 25th and 26th. If you are a student or young professional between the ages of 20 and 29, you should visit steamboatinstitute.org and apply for a scholarship to attend this year's conference. Speakers at last year's conference, uh, there were a bunch of them, but two that uh, were especially notable were country music superstar John Rich and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We will be announcing this year's speaker lineup very soon, so be sure to check steamboatinstitute.org for updates. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and moderator for this evening. And once again, uh, the resolution being debated is illegal crossings of the U.S.-Mexico border are increasing at record levels. The U.S. government must secure the border immediately. And you'll be seeing the uh, poll results as you vote, which I hope you are doing, um, um, on, this, on the screen here shortly. Arguing the affirmative are Julio Rosas and Michael Anton. Julio Rosas is a senior writer for Town Hall. He has previously written at the Washington Examiner, Mediate, and Independent Journal Review, and he is currently serving in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves. Let's give a warm welcome to Julio Rosas.
Also arguing the affirmative, Michael Anton is a lecturer in politics and research fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. He previously served in national security positions in the Trump and Bush 43 administrations. Professor Anton was educated at the Claremont Graduate University, St. John's College, and the University of California. He's the author of the newly released book, The Stakes, America at the Point of No Return. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Michael Anton. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution are Benjamin Waddell and Jose Antonio Vargas. Benjamin Waddell is an associate professor at Fort Lewis College in Durango. He has taught a wide range of courses, including poverty and inequality, social problems, and international migration. His research focuses on the intersection of international migration with development and crime in Latin America and the U.S. Professor Waddell received his BA in International Relations from CU. He also received an MA in Latin American Studies and a PhD in Sociology from the University of New Mexico. Let's give a warm welcome to CU Buff grad, Professor Ben Waddell. Jose, also um, arguing the negative on tonight's resolution, Jose Antonio Vargas is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Emmy nominated filmmaker, and Tony nominated producer. As a leading voice for the human rights of immigrants, he founded the nonprofit media advocacy organization Define American, which was named one of the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company. In 2020, Fortune Magazine named Vargas one of its 40 under 40 most influential people in government and politics. His best-selling memoir, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen, was published in 2018. His second book, White is Not a Country, will be published later this year. Let's give a warm welcome to Jose Antonio Vargas. Our moderator for today's debate is Hadley Heath Manning. Hadley is Vice President for Policy at Independent Women's Forum. Hadley has testified before Congress and state legislators on many policy issues. She also appears frequently in radio and TV outlets across the country and is a regular guest on the Fox Business Network. Hadley is a graduate of the University of North Carolina, and we are proud that she is a Tony Blankley Senior Fellow with Steamboat Institute. Let's give a warm welcome to Hadley Heath Manning from Denver, I might add. And with that, I will let Hadley take it away. Sure. Hi, can everyone hear me? Good evening, thank you for being here. I really do wanna offer a heartfelt thanks to every person who's in attendance tonight, because we, um, at Steamboat Institute, of course, believe in free speech, but just by showing up here tonight, I think everyone in the audience is demonstrating some intellectual curiosity, learning about the issue, and my hope as your moderator for tonight is that even if you don't change your mind, that you could walk away from tonight's event with a better ability to articulate both sides of this debate. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. I'm very excited for this evening's debate. I've never moderated a debate with four debaters before. So I will strive to give equal time to both sides and to all four debaters. Um, but first and foremost, we will start um, by responding to the pre-debate poll. So if you have not done so already, please answer. It looks like there's a big advantage to the agree side. So Julio and Michael, you guys have uh, the majority of the audience with you at this moment. Um, I will repeat the resolution. I know Jennifer read it for everyone, but I will repeat it just to Call it to top of mind, illegal crossings of the U.S.-Mexico border are increasing at record levels. The U.S. government must act to secure the border immediately. Um, and we're going to begin with five-minute opening remarks, first from Julio Rosas. So go ahead, Julio. One point six million. That is the number of illegal immigrants encountered by Border Patrol in fiscal year 2021 which was an historic high. 2.6 million, that is the number of illegal immigrants encountered in fiscal year 2022. 891,000, and that is the current number, most recent number that we have for this year, fiscal year 2023. First part of this statement for this debate says that illegal immigration is reaching an all-time high at our southern border. As someone who has been to the border from San Diego, California, all the way down to Brownsville, Texas, and many other places in between, I cannot emphasize enough of how true that statement is. 
You can see evidence of that in the photos that I've taken over the past two years that are currently being displayed right now. Now, I'm not one to break down a complicated issue like the border to a single item. However, um, since we only have five minutes, uh, what has been happening at our southern border recently can be attributed to something that all human beings respond to, and that is incentives. I saw the formation of the current crisis when I was in Tijuana shortly after Biden entered office in January of 2021. A mass amount of people were trying to get into the United States because they had heard that Biden had promised to halt deportations in his first 100 days in office, which he did try to act on. I met a woman from Honduras, her name was Reina, and she admitted that to me by saying, quote, that is my desire with the 100 days of no deportations. Biden said to the people that they could not be returned back to their country and that they would be given asylum. Now, it did not take long for word to spread among the migrants in Mexico and Latin America and really the rest of the world that if there was any time to illegally cross into the United States, that time would be right now. Now, despite the fact that Biden's deportation halt uh, was overturned in the courts later on, it had set the tone for the next few years. Um, and it was in addition to other policies that they tried to pursue. Uh, now, incentives to illegally come into the United States have existed for a very long time. It predates a lot of us. Uh, you know, but you know, push factors from different countries have existed uh, as well. But what is different with this current administration is that the pull factor, meaning coming from the United States, the pull factor has never been stronger. Uh, the clearest example of this is when DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, at the very start of all this, uh, said at the White House that they do not want unaccompanied minors to come to the border. However, if they do, then they're not going to be returned back to their country of origin. So what do you think happened? Hundreds of thousands of unaccompanied minors have shown up at our border since he made those comments. Uh, and it's a scene that I'm all too familiar with. And in fact, you've probably seen some of them just now. Um, I've seen kids as young as five, four, six years old uh, without their parents uh, walking to find Border Patrol or being processed by Border Patrol. It's because of this massive increase of people willing to pay the cartels and their various affiliates to be brought over into the United States illegally that these criminal organizations have made a killing. Uh, in some areas along the border, they've even shifted, the cartels have shifted their operations to mainly focus on human trafficking and human smuggling as opposed to drug trafficking. This has resulted in this horrific crime being industrialized. Uh, it is estimated the cartels are making almost $13 billion a year currently with smuggling and trafficking people uh, under this current administration as opposed to $500 million uh, a year under President Donald Trump. Uh, in Yuma, Arizona, uh, I've been there many times, uh, that area is significantly smaller than compared to some of the other areas along the border. And they were just as overwhelmed as places like in Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley and Del Rio. And I'm not even talking about people coming from Central America. I'm talking about people coming from Colombia, Haiti, Nicaragua. I've met people as far away as Uzbekistan, Russia, and India. They had reached such a high volume of people coming into this area. Uh, that the Border Patrol leadership ordered their agents to not patrol these areas because if they see people, they have to take them into custody. The reason why they said that is because there was no place to put them because their processing facility was so overwhelmed. In fact, uh, uh, some of the agents at the time joked to me that I was the only American uh, patrolling the border when I was out there uh, talking to the migrants. What I'll end with is that all of what I've just said, and there's a lot more to say, um, it's not just coming from me. It's coming from uh, the locals who live and work down at the border, law, law enforcement, and Border Patrol agents, many of whom have worked under multiple administrations going as far back as George W. Bush. And they've all told me, and they've all told many others, that they have never seen anything like this in their recent history. They, Democrats, Democrats too, local Democrats, have said that at a minimum, what has been happening at our southern border is a humanitarian crisis due to the number of people illegally crossing into this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julio. And uh, next, we'll hear from the opposite side, arguing in the negative, Ben Waddell. All right, good evening. It's nice to see so many folks in the crowd. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start, give a brief introduction to myself. I'm a professor of sociology at Fort Lewis College in Southern Colorado. 
I am a scholar of migration, and I'm a legal advocate for immigrants in the Four Corners region. I work with an organization called Compañeros, the Four Corners Immigrant Resource Center, in conjunction with the work I do at Fort Lewis. Tonight, I'll be making a basic argument. Immigration in the United States is a blessing. This is particularly true for the economy. It has always been this way. But at no point in our history has immigration ever been as important to our nation as it is today. Across 15 years, I've interviewed individuals from countries across Latin America, Africa, and other regions of the world. Through this experience, I've had the opportunity to write down a few hard and fast lessons that I think I would like to share with you tonight. Number one, immigration is not reaching all-time highs. We simply measure it better than we used to in the past. Border Patrol was not created until 1924. In 1990, Border Patrol had an allocated budget of $206 million. Today, their budget is $5 billion. $5 billion. That's a 1,700% increase in their budget since 1990. Not surprisingly, we are much better at measuring people crossing the border today than we were in the 1990s when immigration peaked in this country. Put simply, immigration to the U.S. is arguably much lower than it was in the 1990s. And we measure it better, and therefore we capture more of the folks crossing. Take this, for example. In 2021, there were 84,000 people working for Customs, Border Patrol, and ICE. In 1990, just over 2,000 people. That's an increase of 4,100% in personnel. We're detecting more people crossing the border, not necessarily seeing more crossings. Number three, the recent spike in immigration is real. The increase in immigration from 2020 is a real increase. We have seen a spike in immigration. Now, I know this scares some people, including my adversaries, and apparently, according to the poll, many people in this room. But I think you should see it as a blessing, and here's why. We are getting old. My kids remind me of this. In fact, my daughter's here with me, and we were riding to the airport this morning. I was listening to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which she had never heard of. Um, I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. She reminds me daily of how old I am. I also was going to say I love the Rage Against the Machine, but I thought that might not go over well in this room. <laughs> but we need, we need to remind ourselves of our age as well. My daughter does this every single day. But as a nation, we need to remind ourselves that we're getting older. And I believe that immigration is an opportunity as a result of this. As I look out across this room, I'm reminded of the facts I'm going to share with you. In 1900, the median age in the United States was just 22. 1970, it was 28. And today, it's 40. Any guesses the average age of the farmer in the United States and rancher? 60. 60 years old. Immigration is an economic issue. Our economy demands immigrants. Despite our aging country, there are homes to be built, there are medical facilities to be run, there are cars to fix, there are houses to build, and there are people to serve. The economy demands workers. This is why there is such a demand, a large incentive, as Julio put it, for young workers to come here. Demand for immigration begins in kitchens around across the United States in restaurants. It begins on construction sites. It begins in colleges like this. It begins at places like Walmart, where undocumented workers also work. The demand for immigrants begins with the economy. And so mark my words, we will be inviting people, immigrants, with legal visas to this country that will fly over the ball that is being built on the southern border long before we ever finish it. Number five, and my last point, follow the GDP. So what do we do? Look no further than the GDP. Our economy requires workers, and yet more workers retire each year than ever enter the workforce in a given year. And so we need to pass comprehensive immigration reform, just as Reagan did in 1987. That is the only way forward. A young workforce powers new businesses. It injects lives into schools and universities and ensures economic stability. At the end of the day, immigrants are good for the economy. And nothing in this country has ever dictated policy as well as the GDP. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And up next for opening remarks is Michael Anton. Okay, so there are two um, 
halves to the proposition. The first one is basically a factual matter, and um, Leo spoke to that because he knows the facts. He's been there and seen it. Um, I'm reminded of an old, I'm a philosophy professor, and I think of an old uh, Peanuts cartoon, you know, Charlie Brown cartoon, where Charlie Brown gets the answer on some test wrong, and he says to the teacher, well, I'm much better when, on questions when the answer is just a matter of opinion. So that's, that's what I'm going to give you, just matters of opinion. Um, even if you, you know, I mean, if the second half of the question is, should we have border security? My answer is emphatically, of course. I mean, why would you have a border if you're not going to secure the border? Um, even if you take the position that the border or any border is arbitrary, which as a philosophy professor, I sort of have to take. They are lines drawn on a map, okay? They're not set down by God or, or nature. Um, does that mean once it's drawn, it, it shouldn't be secured or that all, all borders are arbitrary? And I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the only way ultimately not to have a border is to have one world government. If we're going to erase the, all of these borders or any border then, and just say people can go anywhere they want, um, why do we have countries? Why do we have states? I have answers to that as a professor of political philosophy. I don't know that everybody would agree with it. I'm certainly not for one world government because I think it has huge downsides. And I, these argument one hears all the time and what one just heard is that it's good for the economy, even necessary for the economy. I would say a couple things to that. Number one is the United States is a country, not an economy. In fact, there are no economies, strictly speaking, in the world. There are countries with economies, but the countries have interests. They have economic interests and they have other interests as well as their economic interests. If we think about this in terms of the economy, and I completely agree that economics is the number one driver of immigration, right? Essentially, you, you, it's very difficult to leave a country where you grew up, where your ancestors grew up, where your family, friends, everything you've known has been for maybe hundreds of years. You don't leave that lightly. You leave it if you think you're going to do materially appreciably better by going somewhere else, right? And so that's the main driver of why, there are other drivers, but that's the main driver of why people come to the United States because they think they're gonna live better, they're gonna make more money, they're going to have a better life for themselves and for their children. And I understand that thought and I understand the um, thinking and the feeling and the emotion all of those together that it stirs in people. We want to be compassionate. We want to understand that. I want to understand that. But morality and compassion, I think, also require that we think about what we owe to our fellow citizens, right? What do we owe to our fellow? We, you know, we, we, we should be compassionate to every person in the world to the extent possible, but we also have a country of 330 million with fellow citizens to whom we owe obligations. And while I agree that uh, uh, immigration is an economic driver, Immigration also, look, this is a college campus. When I was in college, college students and people in college campus communities used to be somewhat skeptical of big business. That seems less true today. Um, it, big business likes immigration because when the supply of, uh, uh, because labor is always their largest cost and when the supply goes up, the cost goes down, right? They love it for that reason. So this is this sort of strange way in which a traditionally conservative Republican community has found an alliance with the traditionally more left of center activist community over an issue like this. Now, America is, has been the most generous country in the world with regard to immigration. Um, it, I, I don't think there's really any question about that. I personally wouldn't even be here if that were not the case, right? I, as I say to people, I can't trace a single strand of my ancestry back to the, Re the American Revolution, or back to anywhere before the Civil War. Everybody came here, every all of my ancestors came here as immigrants. But I, I still think that doesn't obligate us, the fact that we were allegedly a nation of immigrants, to keeping the borders open forever or to not securing it. And, you know, I, as I said, I teach political philosophy. I could easily appeal to various, you know, Plato, Aristotle, you name it. But that's an argument from authority, right? So who cares about that? I would say it's just common sense. If you have a border, you have to secure it. Otherwise, you don't have it. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. If you don't have security, you don't have a border, and ultimately, you don't have a country, right? People come here, as I said, for a better opportunity, but without a border, with, we're gonna have a free market in labor, which some people, um, both on the left and nominally on the right, have proposed. What you're really talking about is just equalizing the global labor market, which really, at the end of the day, means pushing American wages and standards of living further down. And they've already been stagnating or even declining f basically since I was born, since about 1970. And I, I don't think that's a great policy for my fellow citizens of the United States of America or ultimately in the long term for the United States economy. Um, 
and uh, economics is a driver, I think I've got to stop here, but I'm gonna say this last point, in more than one way, right? The drug cartels that we've talked about, just today, just today, as if to make this point, right? Texas authorities announced that they did the largest single fentanyl seizure ever coming across the border illegally. It was 14 pounds. That's in addition to the thousands that we you know, don't know whatever happened. There's money behind that too. The smugglers that Julio talked about are getting paid a lot of money, right? This human tragedy can really only be solved and addressed with border security. And yes, the United States has been a nation of immigrants. We will still be welcoming of immigrants, but I think it needs to be done in an orderly way supervised by the government, not through lax or no security at the border. Thank you, Michael. And uh, for our final set of opening remarks, we have Jose, again, arguing in the negative. Is that what I'm arguing for? The negative, against this resolution. But against this resolution. You can say what um, you're in favor of. Hi, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I am a journalist by training. It's probably my only religion. Uh, I was covered school board meetings, um, city hall meetings, cops. I covered police beat. And then I was a political reporter. Actually, my first time being in Colorado was in 2008 when Barack Obama and the DNC picked Denver as the, um, where he gave his nominating speech. Um, I learned that facts, the who, the what, the where, and the when are imperative and that context, the why and the how are essential. You know, facts without context is like a tree without no forest. Right? And as a journalist, I, I was taught to be skeptical. In journalism circles, there's actually a famous saying that it says, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> healthy skepticism is healthy. So I am here as a journalist who also happens to be an undocumented immigrant. And I'm here to make sure that facts and context remain a central part, not just the facts we want the sh to picky pick, but actually the broader facts that we can dig deeper in and the context remain a central part of this conversation about immigration founded on the freedom of movement, right? You know, because unless you're Native American or a descendant of enslaved Africans, you came from somewhere else, someplace else. And your legality, whatever that may be, was a product of time, circumstance, and which laws were in place. So today I'm actually making a really basic argument. When it comes to the issue of immigration, which is very personal to me, we have not we are not, and have we, not, we have not been asking the deeper, tougher questions. When it comes to this issue, which is stuck in the muck, seemingly immovable, something we talk about, but we don't do anything. We need to go beyond the typical sound bites and tired talking points you hear from my colleagues in the news media. So just some quick background. I was born in the Philippines. I woke up one morning, my mom put me in a plane. She said I was living with my grandparents, her parents who were both naturalized citizens. I got to California in 1993. Four years later, um, I went to the DMV like any 16 year old to get a driver's permit. And that's when I found out that the green card that my grandfather had given me was fake. So that, that's how I found out that I was here illegally, that the uncle that I thought was my uncle, but I'm Filipino, so everybody's an uncle. He was actually the smuggler who was paid $4,500 to get me here. Um, and there was no legal way for my grandparents to petition me because it's not close enough of a relationship, so immigration law doesn't work that way. And my mother couldn't even come on a tourist visa because she's not a college graduate and she's not socioeconomically viable. So I haven't even seen her in the 30 years since she sent me here, right? That's just the reality of what this issue is. So this was, I was 16, and then I was like, what do I do with my life? Thankfully, my English teacher said, you ask too many annoying questions, you should become a journalist. I was like, what is that? So I did, I became a journalist. I made a career to be a successful journalist. And then once I became that successful journalist, whatever that may even mean, I decided, because I don't know how all these years working as an undocumented journalist, E-Verify never caught me. I don't know why nobody caught the fact that I was here in this country illegally, paying into social security, paying into taxes. I don't know why the social security people don't tell everybody else that undocumented immigrants actually contribute billion dollars into the system and keeps help it solve it. I don't know why you don't know any of this. So against the advice of lawyers, the next slide, I did this. Isn't that the most horrible photo? So against the advice of 28 immigration lawyers, I said I broke all the laws because I had to, so I could work and pay taxes and contribute. I did all of this. And as I was doing all of this, Barack Obama was president. He was deporting 400,000 immigrants that year. I know Barack Obama, I interviewed him. 
didn't hear anything back. So I was getting really tired, and I was like, hey, like, um, why isn't anybody contacting me out of Bill O'Reilly? Right? And all those media people. So I contacted the editor of Time Magazine, and I said, hey, um, I want to know why the government hasn't deported me. So I actually called the government myself. Hi, I haven't heard from you. And the woman on the phone said, oh, why are you calling us? And I said, well, because I haven't heard from you. Are you going to deport me? Why, why not? And she said, no comment. Next slide. This is the reality of undocumented immigrants in this country. You are so obsessed with your borders and your walls that you don't really even know who we are and what we do and what we contribute to this country. You can talk about the economic imperatives, right? You can talk about how much more billions of dollars you want to spend trying to secure from the border. But the fact of the matter is, unless we actually tell people, right? You put a sign up saying, keep out 10 yards in, what do you say? Help wanted. Thank you for having me here. Well, as you all can see, I've got my work cut out for me here. There are so many directions that this conversation could go in these opening remarks. Our panelists have touched on the economic impact, some of the social consequences. We've talked a little bit about border security. We've talked a little bit about immigration broadly. However, as moderator, I do feel that I should have some fealty to the resolution itself. So let's start there. And as Michael noted, it is a resolution in two parts. The first piece is about illegal crossings of the US-Mexico border. Now, Ben mentioned that this is a matter of measurement. And so I'd like to hear first from Julio or Michael, is it simply a matter of measurement or would you still hold that we're at a record high level of illegal border crossings? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how we're keeping track of the numbers of what, of what we're seeing right now. And I didn't even mention uh, that the, the, the millions in, that I talked about at the very beginning, that, that, that's only the, the encounters, right? Uh, right now, there's also an historic number of people who manage to get away. Uh, because what we often see is that when the cartel sends people over, because no one can cross <laughs> illegally without some sort of criminal organization, uh, you know, you have to pay them. Uh, they often like to, you know, the people that pay to turn themselves in uh, because, they, you know, they want to be processed and released and get into the asylum uh, court proceedings, uh, they will send them all at once. And we've seen, I've seen numbers as large as 500, 600. Um, and so you, all those resources get sucked up into processing them, handling them, transporting them. And that leaves uh, uh, manpower gaps. So we can, you know, we talk about technology, uh, you, you talked about that, you mentioned about, well, that's how we're keeping track. Uh, well, the problem is that when you, when you only have this technology, even infrastructure like the wall, uh, if there's no one to, to catch the person on the other side, because they're busy, you know, a couple miles away processing 500 people all at once, um, they're going to be able to get away. Um, and so those are the known guys. It's a, right now we're about like, for, for last fiscal year, it was around uh, 600,000 people, right? So we don't know who they are. We don't know, you know, sure, I'm sure a lot of them uh, just didn't want to get caught because they probably wouldn't qualify for asylum. So, you know, they don't have any ill intentions per se. But that's where you also find the more hardened criminal element because they know they, they do do background checks. They do uh, you know, try to uh, process these people. So all that to say is that, I mean, it, it's not so much a measurement issue. I, I would say that, again, I, I have to go back to incentives that are coming from this administration, it's a gamble. I mean, when you put your life in the hands of smugglers, you're, you're, you're gambling, right? So you, yeah, you might have a push factor uh, pushing out of a Central American or Latin American country, but there, that, that pull factor is very real and I've yet to you know, encounter uh, any migrants that's, you know, that, that hasn't told me if I've asked them to say, you know, say, well, yeah, of course, I'm coming now because this is the time because Biden's in office. Thank you. Ben and Jose, I want to hear about the push and pull factors from you, but first I want to ask a question of Ben related to his opening remarks. Ben, your opening remarks struck me as remarks generally about immigration. However, I want to narrow in first and foremost on illegal or undocumented immigration and specifically border crossings. And so I wanted to get your perspective on illegal border crossings aside from the volume or scope or where you might disagree with Julio in terms of whether or not we're at record high levels. Do you see illegal crossings of the U.S.-Mexico border as a problem? Why or why not? It's a great question. So I, I've slept, like Julio, I've spent time on the border. I've slept in migrant shelters. I've, I've eaten with migrants in the morning. Um, the majority of migrants on the border in these shelters today are deportees. 
Majority of them are folks that are not traveling north, they're traveling south, and they don't really have anywhere to go because their families, they've been removed from their families for 20, 30, 40 years in some cases. I've seen individuals retired, like many of you, crying um, in, in the little things that they have left in these migrant shelters uh, with the, the clothes that they have on their back because their whole life is on the other side of the border. So there's a human side to this, as uh, Michael recognized. But I think when we think about the measurement of these issues, there are facts that matter. 58% of the 11 million people who are estimated to be undocumented in this country came across the border without documentation. The other 42% came with legal entry into this country. They came with tourist visas. They came with workers' visas. They came seeking asylum. And they are here and undocumented in this country for the sole reason of we don't have a path for them. We gave them a path into the United States, but there is no path for them to legalize. And so 42% of, of folks didn't cross the border undocumented. They came with legal documentation. They were inspected at the border. And they're just waiting for a path that so many people talk about, getting in line. There is no line for them. And so when it comes to that issue, um, I think we have to recognize that, that a lot of people have come here legally. When it comes to the measurement issue, I think if anyone spent any time like I did growing up around the border and going down to the, the regions like Nogales or, or Juarez um, or Tijuana, uh, what you saw 20, 30 years ago was a circular migration. People would come six, seven months, they'd work, they'd go home, they'd improve their families, they'd improve their way of life. They would do exactly what people asked them to do, go back to your home and improve it. That's why they came here, is to improve their home. The border wall has done something fundamental. It has stopped the ability of people to go home. The average stay of people in this country has gone up as we've built more wall and we've invested in ICE and Border Patrol and such. So people are not stopping coming, as Julio points out in the photos you saw in the opening show. They're coming, but they're not going home anymore. And it's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. So then are illegals crossing the problem or not? In, in my mind, the problem is the policy. We don't have a policy for people. There is no line. There's no way to become legal. So maybe they're a symptom of a problem. OK. Jose, I want to hear from you because you, uh, you seem to have something to say about what Julio mentioned earlier about the push and pull factors. What do we know about people who are crossing the border or undocumented immigrants in general and their motivations? What do we do? Before I get to that, I just kind of want to, because I'm sure you all are going to get a sense of this. Ben and I are basically, Ben, I don't want to speak for you, but the wording of this resolution is actually part of the issue, right? Like the framing itself is part of, I'm not going to call it a problem because I'm grateful to have been invited here, but, but for me, the framing itself is kind of symptomatic of how we've talked about the issue, right? So let me answer your question more directly, and I didn't get a chance to do this because I want to respect the time. So I was invited to testify in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2012, 2013. And, and Jeff Sessions uh, was in the committee, Senator Jeff Sessions and Senator Ted Cruz, who Ted Cruz, you know, I don't even know, by the way, what Fox News would do without undocumented immigrants. They <laughs> just really profited from us so greatly. So here's Ted Cruz, always talking about undocumented people. Here I am, the first undocumented person testifying in front of Congress. He doesn't even pay attention to my testimony. I testify, Jeff Sessions, bless his heart, was the first person to ask the question, Mr. Vargas, do you think this country has a right to secure its borders? My answer, yes, absolutely. Absolutely a country has the responsibility to say, this is the country, in the same way that has the responsibility to say, oh yeah, and we got, by the way, California, Arizona, New Mexico, used to be parts of Mexico, right? Like it actually has a responsibility to say, this is what, this is how we got to be what we are. So when I answered that question, I said, yes, Senator, absolutely the country has a right to define its borders, and a country has a right to define border security. So to answer this question, I actually agree with the resolution. What I don't agree with, or what I think needs further questioning is the framing of it, right? So for example, Julio, when you say that it's the government incentive, I actually, Think, you know, there used to be a saying in journalism circles that the Washington Post is for people who think they're, who, who the, the New York Times is for people who want to run the country. The Washington Post is for people who think they run the country. And the Wall Street Journal 
is for people who run the country, <laughs> right? It's not the government here. It's the business community. When Reagan passed amnesty in 1986, the biggest failure of that, but there was no incentive at all to say to the business community, you can't hire undocumented people. The reality is in Texas, half of the construction labor are undocumented labor. And, you know, and yet, when I came out as undocumented, there was actually a law that was being introduced by a state legislator, a, a, a Republican woman, who said that it would be illegal for you to hire an undocumented worker unless the undocumented worker is a maid. And then I think for me further, because we're all taxpayers here, I pay so much taxes, I should be a Republican. Um, how many more billions of dollars do we want to spend securing this border? How, how many more billions? I actually think that's a really good question, because then it would then tell us the system is not working. If the only people that's getting richer, and you know, look, people need jobs. When I got detained. I don't know how many people here have gotten detained at the border. I got detained at the border. Um, it was jarring. It was jarring because I was in a, this was when Obama was president in 2014. It was jarring because I was in a jail cell, like 16 by 20, and I was with the boys. They separated the boys from the girls. It was like ages six to like 12. Um, and it was really interesting because they were all, you know, Latina, Latino kids, and I couldn't look them in the eye. All I could look up was their shoes because they were all wearing like Adidas, Nike, whatever. And then all I could thinking about was, it's amazing that these kids can wear shoes from companies that are borderless, that can promote the shoes in their countries, but God forbid they walk here 3,000 miles on those shoes and we put them in a jail cell. Well, I want to get Michael into the conversation because you're touching directly on some of the things yeah. that he mentioned in his remarks, including the rights of sovereign countries to have borders or the function, the purpose of borders. So, Michael, I'd like for you to expand on that a little bit, but also... Jose is bringing up some of the economic arguments that you touched on, including what I consider to be somewhat of a populist argument that the increase in uh, labor force participants, particularly among maybe low skill or lower education people in the United States, depresses the average price of labor, which we also know as a wage. And so I want to hear more from you, Michael, about some of these arguments. It sounds like maybe you and Jose agree that the United States has a right to have borders and to secure borders, but what would you say specifically to Jose's question, how many more dollars do we want to spend, or what do you think specifically we should do to secure the borders? I mean, my answer to the how many more dollars do we want to spend is, first of all, I don't think it would be that expensive to secure the border in a way that, I mean, certainly not expensive compared to lots of other things the government spends money on. I mean, I read yesterday the new latest Pentagon budget is going to be $898 billion. Um, in any event, I fundamentally actually agree with Ben and Jose on something that they said, which is, yes, the United States as a society is a giant hypocrite about this. Giant. We, we pass laws and we don't enforce them, yep. right? There is a segment of the population of which I am one who thinks we need to have better border security and all of this stuff. But I'm in, I'm in the political minority as far as that goes, right? The business community doesn't want it. They're right about that. It's never wanted it. Right, including, and the Republican Party, which the business community used to be the major supporter of, it's now a little bit more democratic than that, right? The Republican Party doesn't really want to do anything about it. In fact, they were horrified by Trump all throughout 2016 running on this issue and sought to torpedo him every which way. And then they tried to block the implementation of his agenda while he was president. So the political class doesn't really want it, the business class doesn't really want it, the intellectual class doesn't want it, the New York Times doesn't want it. Everybody who really has power in America likes the system the way it is, or would like to make it even looser. So there's really no, I mean, to those of you who are taking the other side, I guess my good news for you is there's, no, there's not a significant large enough constituency for the views that I hold to ever make them policy. So you're winning, and I think you're going to keep winning. Can I follow up by asking you, if you were in charge, if you were the czar of America, or you didn't have to have a political constituency, you just could make any rules that you wanted to secure the border, what would be the policy specifically that you would recommend to secure the border? I, mean, I would like physical security at the southern border to address the humanitarian crisis, to address the fentanyl, to address the cartels, to address the crime. I think there should be more uh, workplace enforcement in the United States so that people who are not here legally cannot undercut wages for people who are here legally. That's something the business community doesn't want to see because it obviously benefits them. It obviously benefits um, immigrants for obvious reasons, right? But I, if we were serious about this problem as a country, which we're not, we would do that, and we, and we don't do that. Thank you. So, Ben, what's wrong, with those, what's wrong with those policies that Michael just mentioned? I mean, in other words, 
and, and this is, I don't want to get into audience questions too soon, but several of you have already submitted questions, and one of them corresponds to something I wanted to ask about. So I'll, I'll jump in and ask an audience question. I'm going to turn to the audience questions entirely soon. So this is your reminder to please submit some questions to add to this discussion. But Do you want me to answer what's wrong? Or no. I, <laughs> want me to hold? I, I want you to tell me what's wrong, but in the context of can we not be pro-immigration as a country, but also pro-border security? What's wrong with being in favor of both those things? Yeah, I mean, I guess my question to Michael would be, don't we have those things on the southern border? Have you spent time on the southern border? Have you seen the level of, uh, it's a military state. I have as well. I mean, it, it, the, it is a military state on the border. Yep. You do not have constitutional rights nope. within the 33 miles between the border and the, the range where they do checkpoints. And if, if you don't believe that's true, you should go to the southern border. You should check it out. Because it's not just the southern border. That 33-mile radius goes around the country. And Border Patrol is starting to pop up in Maryland within 33 miles of the coast. It's starting to pop up in Virginia within 33 miles of the coast. And you do not have the constitutional rights that you believe, cherish, and care about that you have outside of that 33-mile range. And if you don't believe that, ask folks that have been detained. Um, I want to answer the question directly talking about SB 1070. It was passed in Arizona in 2010, and Arizona has backed away from that ever since because it ruined their economy. They walked away from it. Alabama passed similar legislation after SB 1070. They backed away from it because they couldn't get crops out of the fields. Florida, in the next two or three weeks, is gonna, the census is going to sign this bill, and he is going to start giving out felonies. He's going to do exactly what Michael is asking. He's going to give out felonies to people who hire, transport, or work with undocumented immigrants. And I guarantee you within 10, 10 years, Florida will back away from it as well. We do not enforce it for the exact reasons that Michael's saying. We don't want to. I want to bring in Julio and ask you if you agree with Ben's assessment that, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Ben, but it sounds like you're making the assertion, assertion that our current approach to border security undermines constitutional rights, at least close to the border? Well, I mean, there, there's facial recognition. I'm looking at the camera right now. There's facial recognition on many of our doors. There's cameras. All that facial recognition also corresponds to federal agents. 84,000 of them can correspond between that data. Google contracts with some of these. Some of you are giving that information to them. Does that, um, does that comport with your experience at the border? Do and you? that's on the border, and that's soon coming to a town near you. Well, I mean, what? It, it, we, we, we agree that there is a policy problem, and, and, and Jose was saying that uh, it's, it's more of the business side, and I, obviously, there, there's, I think we're all in agreement that that's, that is a problem, but as I said in my opening statement, it's, it's also coming from the government, and that's what, under this administration, I mean, in addition to Biden campaigning on halting deportations for 100 days, it's illegal, it will we'll give health care to undocumented people, we're going to halt the construction of the border wall, we're going to get rid of Remain in Mexico, and, he's try, and he has tried to follow through on those things. And, and, and so rhetoric does matter, and it's not just the rhetoric, but part of the reason why, I mean, people like to blame on the left, uh, I'm not saying these two, but people on the left like to blame Republicans. Uh, for incentivizing people to come because they're the ones saying, oh, well, that, that, they're saying that the border's open, so uh, that's their fault. Well, you know, they're not watching Fox News. They're not reading Town Hall. Um, they, they are in what, uh, WhatsApp groups. They're in Facebook groups, uh, even TikTok. And they're all talking, and they're all sharing their stories about how they paid a smuggler, they were brought over, they handed themselves in, or they were able to get away, and uh, this is how I did it. I mean, that, that, that's, the, that's the ecosystem that is happening right now. And again, I have to go back to um, the fact that when you, when you signal those types of policies, even if, it, even if I mean, because even now they're trying to do like the CBP one app, which is failing. Uh, right now in El Paso, we got about 1,000 Venezuelans crossing every day right now, currently, uh, because the, the app is not working kind of as efficiently as the migrants want, <laughs> want it to. Um, and, and, and so the fact is that, yeah, th that is the pull factor, right? The businesses that has existed for decades. But, but the, the current pull factor and what has made the significant up increase, I mean, you, you literally see it on the, on the line graph that, on the CBP's website. You literally see January 2021 to February 2021, and you just see this massive spike. Well, I mean, what was the big difference? <laughs> the Pandemic. It was the pandemic. I yeah. I uh, Brandon, you might be able to speak to the way rhetoric matters. Yes. Um, 
this is something I had to really understand because I'm like, why did my mom put me on a plane? She did, she, did she just not want to see me for the next 30 years? Why would a parent want to do that? When I was detained with those kids, what kept me going was just creating a narratives in my head about what did the parents say to the kids? Go walk 3,000 miles without us? So I'm not sure you could build a wall or a border that could withstand like what parents do for their kids. I'm just not sure you could do that. Now, absolutely, going back to the agreement, there needs to be, it's a policy, but then how you execute it, then how you talk about it. Now, Julio, to your point, I, I see what you're saying. I also come from a perspective where Barack Obama has to actually talk about the fact that he deported 3 million people. The reality is both of these parties are distinctly responsible for why we're in this mess. I can't go leave the, I have not, I don't want to use the word stuck, <laughs> but I've been stuck here for 30 years, right? Like I can't leave because if I leave, there's no guarantee I'd be allowed back. That's because of what Bill Clinton passed into law in 1996. The same year, by the way, that the IRS gave you what's called an ITIN number. Do you all know what that is? ITIN, I-T-I-N, please Google it. It is how undocumented workers pay billions of dollars in taxes. Right? So it's, it, it's a giant hypocrisy. It's a complete governmental failure. I think, I actually think immigration is a manifestation of just a, the government's inability to actually do its job and the lack of trust that people, citizens, have on the government. And the last thing I'll say is, I am neither a Republican or a Democrat or a left or a right. I am kind of a traditional journalist in this way. I am independent. Um, and again, both of these parties to me, um, and the media and how we frame this, I'm working on a project now that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's basically box, you know, the, the kind of the great replacement theory and how we got there, right? And kind of trying to understand Fox News, conservative talk radio, town hall, right? Like uh, that whole ecosystem, right? Because I, I knew the creators of town hall back in DC, back in the late, uh, in the mid two, two, 2000s. So I'm just really trying to understand how we got to this point. Um, okay, okay, okay. To respond specifically to Julio's assertion that we saw a big uptick yes. in border crossings after the Biden administration took. And it's remained high ever since. I think it's unfair to answer that directly. I think it's unfair to put all of that in Biden's rhetoric, given the fact that the Biden administration actually hasn't done all that much right about this issue. Today was a rare one. Today they said that DACA, people who have DACA, can have health insurance. That's a rare win for immigrants, for undocumented people in, what, four, three years of this administration. But because the policies hasn't, haven't changed much, then yeah. does that give more fuel to... Julio's fire in suggesting that it was the rhetoric, actually. I mean, I, I, so the I mean, I would say that the policy has changed because, I mean, Remain in Mexico is nowhere near what it once was as it was under the Trump administration. The, bo the border wall, I mean, the, I've seen the gaps. There's material that's been out there since 2021. And, I'm not, and of course, like I said, it, do, it doesn't matter what you have in place, right? Because it, the policy does a change. When, when you often hear Border Patrol agents tell me and have, have told members of Congress, they don't want any more funding because you talk about like how much more money do we want to spend. If you really want to ta tackle this issue that we're currently experiencing right now, and I mean, DACA, that was 10 years ago or you know, more than that. More than years ago. Yeah, yeah, more than that. Um, they, just, they just want changes in policy. If, if, if they, 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 you know, that's what they've said. If we get these changes in policy, we go back to at least something more consistent under the Trump administration, we're going to see a decrease in crossings. Now, of course, I'm sure they're happy to take more money, but that's what that's what border patrol agents and on top of that. But yes, they do pay taxes and it equals in the billions. But right now, because of our system not being able to absorb this large number of people in such a short, acute amount of time, I mean, here in Denver, they're spending eight hundred thousand dollars a week trying to, you know, for all the services from all the migrants that are coming up from the southern border because they're being released. That's about twenty million dollars uh, going through June. Uh, the Heritage Foundation. They've done, a, they've done an analysis. It's costing Illinois, not a border state, uh, $9.5 billion for services because, again, people are coming up in large numbers from the southern border. They're requiring assistance. They're requiring uh, all, these, all these sorts of things. So there is also a cost to illegal immigration. And, I, and whether or not like one outdoes the other, I mean, I just, again, 
when it's not set up for this, when the system's not set up for it, and yeah, we agree the system's broken, but that doesn't make it okay for them people to just come in in large, large amounts of numbers in such a short amount. I'll, I'll just quickly say to respond to this, and then I very want to get quickly, to these very audience questions. I just, Re I actually don't think the system is broken. I think it's doing what it's extended to do. This country was built on the back of cheap labor. Black people have been telling us that since time immemorial, right? Italians and Irish, the people that built, everybody can tell us all about that. It is, it is not broken, it is doing entirely how it's supposed to do. Now, thank you, Julio, by the way, for saying that we could trade numbers, and I'm so sorry, again, this is the journalistic nerd in me. I'm all about primary sources, so where are your sources coming from? I'm not sure I can trust the sources from the Heritage Foundation. That's fine, I do. I would rather call the Social Security Administration, I'd rather call the IRS myself, I wanna go to the primary sources to tell me how many millions of dollars are people putting in. So according to the IRS, you just cited from the Heritage Foundation, undocumented people in Colorado paid 156.5 million in state taxes. So I don't know if that's enough to pay for what that is, but the last point I'll make, we get to the questions. <laughs> We're also more than labor. Immigrants are here not just for your labor. In the same way that their ancestors who came here were not just here for labor. I actually think what I would ask all of us is a modicum of humility in terms of what makes their experience different now from what the experiences were of your great grandparents when they crossed that Ellis Island and there was no board patrol and nobody asked for a green card. I uh, have a question that relates to all of this, but it's an excellent audience question, so thank you. I, I've got more than 30, 33 answers questions so far. <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to get to 33 audience questions, but I will do my best to get to as many of the subtopics here that our very smart uh, questioners from the audience have mentioned. So um, in terms of the system being broken or not, one questioner agrees that the uh, immigration system is broken because their question goes like this, and I'd like to pose this question first to Michael. Wouldn't you agree that in order to secure our borders, what needs to happen is to fix our broken immigration system? And I presume that this questioner is asking about our legal immigration yeah. system. I mean, just as a factual matter, no, I wouldn't agree. Whether it would be wiser policy to do it all at once is a different question, but we could secure the border without doing anything else if we wanted to. Um, look, I. It was said a little earlier, I forgot who said it, I apologize, I'm the oldest one here, so I'm a little bit, uh, that you know uh, the system is failing. I don't think it's failing. I think it's working more or less as intended. I actually think if, to go back to the, the point which I basically agree with, that the, you know, the, about the Times, the Post, and the Wall Street Journal, people who actually own and run the country, if they had their way, they'd get, we would have a much looser immigration system than we have now. Yeah. The things that they don't get implemented are things they, when they get afraid of voters or they, they pull bad and they get a little scared and they pull back, right? But mostly what they want is a, a fairly loose system with fairly loose border controls and, and, and loose to no um, employment regulations in the country. And, all that. and they have that. And when uh, you know, a Trump comes along or some Republicans come along and propose tightening those things up, they're usually successful at defeating them. So I, this is not, it may be failing on some kind of metaphysical level, but it's not failing in the sense that it isn't doing what it is intended to do by the people who actually run the country. I think it is doing what it's intended to do by the people who actually run the country. Ben, since you spoke earlier about fixing the legal immigration system where you said we don't give people a pathway, yeah. what's your response to this question that mm. in order to uh, secure our borders, what needs to happen is to fix our broken immigration system. I oftentimes, in the fall, they have these beautiful mazes, the pumpkin patches, and they have all these, you know, straw bales, and they build these labyrinths, and it's a scary thing for a father because you take your, your kids there, and they're shorter than the, the stacks, right? And so they, the kids get lost in there. It takes them forever to, to get out. Um, I'm often reminded when I'm in these mazes, right, in the fall, of the immigration system because it's the exact same thing. You get into one corner and there's a wall. And then you go to the next and you think, oh, this is the way out. And then there's a wall. And then you get to the next. And the whole way, you're paying. These, these labyrinths are similar. I'm not sure how I get to these fields in the middle of nowhere and I drop 100 bucks before I know it, like, you know, on, on kids and go into these events. Um, it is the exact same thing. I want to give you a, just a brief anecdote. Um, the other day I was uh, 8 a.m. Uh, young man, individual had come from a South American country. Um, he got in in late February. He was detained. He was let go in Georgia. So he came in in El Paso. He ends up in Georgia, private detention center. His father was detained as well. His father's still in detention. He gets out. 
He has a family member in Colorado, so he comes to Colorado. And, of course, there's no way within those two or three days for him to get written notice that he has a court date in Georgia, right? And so, so he appears. We, we, you know, we say, hey, you got a court date, and so we appear, we get him there. Um, the judge says, oh, don't worry, you know, we're going to change a venue, we'll get you to Colorado. Next day, he has a court venue with the same judge that said that, that there was no longer a trial for that individual. If he had missed that second court date, he'd be in deportation proceedings right now. And he's not because we were aware of it. But that's just the beginning. Right? This individual whose, whose father was a coroner is threatened by cartels and guerrilla warriors because of the work that he wouldn't do for them. And, and he's just looking for a way. He's 19. He's looking for a way to survive. And so that's why he's here, like many of the millions that have shown up in the border. Something we haven't talked about. Why did the numbers spike in 2020? Remember that I said in my opening remarks, they did spike. They spiked because there is a recession that we don't think about or talk about because in the United States, we pump billions of dollars, trillions really, into the economy during the Trump, the last few years of the Trump administration, the early years of the Biden administration. So our economy has done pretty well. We've, we've, been, we've managed to get through the pandemic and our economy has recovered. The world has not, and especially developing countries. People are in situations of anguish and they're leaving because they're in abject poverty. That, that is the issue, right? There is an economic crisis around the world that is silent in the United States. Yeah. Khalil, do you want to respond to the uh, argument that people are simply fleeing desperate situations and coming, finding another desperate situation at our border? I mean, I mean that, that is the push factor that I was, I was talking about. But again, why did it not happen in December of 2020? Why didn't it happen in, in, in November, right? Because again, it all can't just be blamed on, on COVID. And that's why then, because for the longest time, in fact, too long, right? I mean, the, the, emer the emergency declaration for COVID finally ended for us here in the States not too long ago, right? So, and um, people have been saying that COVID is still a very much important issue. I, I disagree with that. But what, what, what I will say is that, again, when it comes to how the system is set up and how, you know, for all of its faults and for all of its, it, why would you want to, uh, incentivize and why would you want to have this mass flow of people to burden a system that's already burdened? I'm going to move on because we have so many audience questions. I want to get to a few more. One is specifically for you, Michael. Why should corporations, and you'll have to push back if you don't agree with this <laughs> phrasing, but why should corporations have the freedom to cross borders, hmm. if that's something you believe, with restrictions, with few restrictions? but workers should not. So I'll read it again. Why should corporations have the freedom to cross borders with few restrictions, but workers should not? I mean, if, if by the, the first half of that, what is meant is you know, outsourcing and setting up um, operations overseas and these kinds of things. I mean, this is a question on which I have drifted to the left. If you had asked me this question 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, I would have been much more of a traditional Heritage Foundation Republican and giving you a kind of free market answer. They should be able to do whatever they want. Now I'm happy with placing restrictions on that exactly for the same kind of reasons of favoring your own citizens and the industries in your own country over uh, those in, in other countries. Not, you know, and we would have to just, it wouldn't be any kind of blanket restriction, but I think prudent restrictions on that kind of thing are possible. That Ultimately, though, the question of, of the movement of people comes down to, I think the core disagreement here comes down to, do you think that citizenship is a fundamental distinction in politics and that if you accept it, you have obligations to your fellow citizens that you don't necessarily have for other people, however much you may feel compassion for them, however dire straits they may be in. And I think I definitely take the position that yes, you have extra and more important and more solid obligations to your fellow citizens. And I think that has become a minority view in the United States. I don't think most people agree with that anymore. They see suffering, they see, and they think, I feel compassion toward these people. And if they want to come here, they'll make our country better. That's a good thing. And only the hard hearted are going to oppose that. And it's, you know, look, you're on the losing side in a way when you take a position where I basically have to argue the hard hearted positions. Like, yeah, well, you know, we, we should favor our own people. And then there are going to be other people who don't get favored. And they may not be able to improve their lives because of our exclusionary policy. And I'm the Grinch. I get that. It's not a difficult position to argue. I'm sorry, it's not an easy position to argue. All I can say is I think it's ultimately logically consistent. And one last very on topic, though. The real pull factor in the United States is simply that, for the time being at least, we're still a, a richer country than almost any other country in the world. right? And 
People leave, in general, poorer countries to go to richer countries. We're not the only richer country in the world. Let's not forget something here. We're not the only country with an illegal immigration problem, either. There are countries in Latin America. There are countries in Asia that have this problem precisely because some are richer, some are poor. People tend to want to leave the poorer countries and move to the richer country. Mexico is not a particularly poor country. It's just poorer than the United States. In terms of act its actual level of economic development, it's in the middle of the pack globally, actually kind of in the upper middle, Twelve. right? It, well, I don't. It's certainly not twelve in terms of per capita GDP. Population. Yeah, yeah. No, but not per capita GDP. Uh, in any event, it's the point is made. It's it, it's there are many poorer countries to the south of Mexico, and Mexico has an illegal immigration problem because if you're in a poorer, more violent country south of Mexico, you'd be better off in Mexico. But Mexico does a better job and takes securing its southern border more securely than the United States does. It's sort of a matter of political will, and they have more of it than we do for reasons I think I've already outlined. I want to hear what you think about citizenship, Jose, and maybe in the context of this audience question. Do you feel badly that a US citizen might have been passed over for an opportunity because you were given that opportunity? Or I'll, I'll rephrase more broadly, maybe because some undocumented immigrant, yeah. any undocumented immigrant was given an opportunity. Oh, gosh, I actually really believe that. Really believe I believe when I was a kid, I believed that I was stealing someone else's job. I, when I got those internships, I remember when I got my internship at the Washington Post, it was a big internship because people apply for it, 16 people get it. My first call was my high school principal, who's like my mom, and I said, Pat, did I take somebody else's job? And she goes, what are you talking about? You earned it. And I had to really sit with that. And then I did this delusional thing where I started thinking, I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna do such a good job that nobody else can do what I do. Right, I, I did the whole like, I'm an individual, like no superior, I'm better. And then you realize that that's also a losing end. I think, but that framing of that question is that we live in a zero sum society. We actually don't, right? We actually don't. And I know that because in the past 12 years, I've met so many, you know, far, I, mean, talk, I mean, talk about farming, right? Like, by the way, in the Philippines, I come from a family of farmers. There's nothing low scaled about farming. If you don't know what that's like, go try, go try it out, <laughs> all right? Um, so the fact that when I was, in, I went to Alabama after they passed that law, because I'm crazy like that, and, <laughs> and I met so many, you know, third, fourth generation Alabamans who were like, oh my God, I can't believe Julio, actually one guy was named Julio, Julio Javier, there was another guy, Ricardo, who all from Guatemala, who the farmer was like trying to figure out, hired a lawyer, did everything he could because now they're a part of the family. I actually think part of the issue here is we haven't, we've seen this issue as if these 11 million undocumented people are islands onto themselves. They're not. Every single one of them have teachers, mentors, coworkers, friends, lovers, right? And so when you're talking about one undocumented person, you're actually talking about like 10 people whose lives they're impacting. The citizenship thing, I think I'll save that for my closing remarks. Okay. <laughs> That's a big question. Great. Uh, we have. More than 40 now uh, audience questions. So Ooh. I'm going to um, pose one more audience question and uh, then we're gonna probably have to move to our closing remarks. So um, actually Michael touched on this topic, but, uh, and actually uh, Taylor uh, Jaworski from the Benson Center touched on this in his opening remarks that immigration is something that touches every country in the world. Yeah. And so uh, one of our audience members asked a question that was also in my list of questions that I previewed to our panelists, so I hope they have good prepared answers. But how does the situation in the US compare to countries in Europe, for example? This is an audience question comparing our, um, our human uh, immigration problem to some of the humanitarian crises we've seen in terms of refugee crises in Europe and so forth. How, how is the situation similar or different and how have other maybe wealthy or developed nations dealt with border security I don't know who wants to I go mean, first here. In Europe, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a lot different in many ways and very similar in certain ways. Um, you have a, a Mediterranean Sea to cross that makes it a lot more difficult. The Europeans, and it very much their response waxes and wanes depending on who's in power. So when you have a Matteo Salvini in power in Italy, the Italians, or Maloney, Italians really do try to interdict boats and, and, and process immigrants and try to find places to resettle them rather than just letting them come into the country when you have more, I don't know when you want to, whether they're more left of center or more globalist governments in power in Italy or Spain or Greece, you have, uh, there's a, just a looser policy all the way about it. One thing that really 
the biggest difference that stands out is the refugee surge of 2015 when the Syrian civil war broke out. And that gets to um, Julio's point, right? That was definitely a pull factor when the chancellor of Germany said, come, right? Come, please. And people got the message. And they said, I, I want to go there because this is a much richer country with a much more highly developed economy and a much higher standard of living. Also, it's not in the middle of a civil war, right? And Germany got a surge of about a million people over the course of a year when the chancellor, her, who essentially issued the invite, said that might, she never exactly admitted this, but her revealed preference, <laughs> but based on her actions, was to admit that was probably a mistake and started to tighten it up. But you know, we, here we are, we're eight years later, and Germany is really still dealing with the after effects of that surge, and, uh, which have caused tremendous financial problems, um, serious crime problems in some of the major German cities. Uh, and you know, it, that's something that the United States hasn't had to deal with in quite the same way, um, in part because, like I said, we've had this, we've, I think we all kind of agreed that we've had a de facto system in place for a long time that as chaotic as it is, as dumb and irrational as it is in many ways, there's something sort of regular about it that it was not similar to the European experience. Thank you for that answer. I'm sorry that we do have to move to our closing remarks now. I know we have many audience questions that did not get uh, a hearing with this excellent group of panelists, so I hope that Maybe you can find the panelists after the event. <laughs> Please don't swamp them with dozens and dozens of questions. Thank you so much for submitting the questions. And I'd also like to remind everyone that uh, just as we did before this debate and asking a poll question of our audience, we're asking the same question in a post-debate poll. And so don't forget, in just a moment, you'll have the opportunity to respond to a post-debate poll. So now we're going to move to closing remarks, and we're going to go in the opposite order as our opening remarks. So we will be starting with uh, Jose. And this time, each panelist has two minutes and 30 seconds, so uh, half the time they had for opening remarks. Go ahead, Jose. I had an entire thing written down, but Michael activated something in me. So I'm just going to do this in two minutes. Um, how many people here are US citizens? Can you raise your hand? How'd you get it? Born here. What did you do to earn it? You applied. Great. Um, but this question of earning it, right, um, which has been in every single, I think, immigration reform bill since Reagan didn't, you know, since, uh, since amnesty happened, and here we are with this mess that we're with. And that's, I, I took that to heart. <laughs> deeply as a 16 year old, because I actually thought I really needed to earn it. I thought it, I thought it meant that I needed to actually contribute to this country. I thought it meant that I had to stay out of my own silo and my own island and make sure that I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And I would argue that undocumented immigrants in this country actually show Americans what true citizenship actually is. I would, I would argue that these people, I don't know if you all know this, there are only 20 states, I'm happy to say that Colorado is one of them, that allow undocumented immigrants to drive. I don't know how all those 1.5 million undocumented people in Texas, I don't know how they're getting around. Is there a subway system in Texas I don't know about? How are the million undocumented people in Florida getting around? Is, is there like a metro rail that we don't know about? It's incredible. I'm actually surprised the sky hasn't fallen with the amount that undocumented workers who, by the way, are responsible, if you look at every service industry in this country, what we go to and what we rely on. Um, there's a part of me that sometimes I wish I, we would just get a little thank you, <laughs> right? But that's not part of the narrative. It doesn't fit the talking points. Now, lastly, um, I live in the Republic of Berkeley. I didn't realize that <laughs> it's such a, you know, people joke that it's like, you know, like the most radical place. It's, Actually, not quite that. Um, so it's about two hours from the Central Valley. So when the, um, COVID happened, my biggest worry were all those undocumented farmers, right? Estimates between half to two thirds of all the farmers in this country are undocumented. Your very, very sustenance depend on undocumented labor. And in many ways, the no comment from the ICE agent is what we're getting from all of you, because so long as you can have your dinners, so long as you can have your cheap labor. It's actually not your problem. You don't need to solve it. You don't have to earn it. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, next, we'll hear again from Michael. Uh, OK, in no particular order. I, I don't, as, as good as that point about earning it sounds, if you try to think it through logically, what does it mean? 
I mean, it's part of human nature and has been true in human history that you are a citizen of the country or political entity in which you were born. That's just always been the way it is. And I don't see an alternative to that. What should we do? Start having a test when you, for everybody born in the United States when you're 18 and if you don't pass it or if you don't meet some criteria, you get kicked out in any event. It says at the very preamble to the United States Constitution that the thing is being uh, enacted for ourselves and our posterity. In other words, for the children who come after. So um, just because I, I, I have ancestors who in fact did have to earn it, who did come here legally and who did have to naturalize. Uh, so I don't know where we're exactly supposed to go with that. On the point about Undocument everybody knows that undocumented workers do a ton of work in the United States. There's no question about it. I don't think that though you can um, extrapolate from that fact that the work simply would not otherwise get done. I mean, yeah, totally. there are one of the thing, one of the reasons why big business so much loves um, very loose immigration um, restrictions and loose immigration and border policies is because again, the supply of labor goes up, the cost goes down. Business doesn't want to have to pay more. It would have to pay more if it tightened the labor market. And one of the things that we saw, uh, as economics uh, economists can show you, is even though, yes, Trump didn't finish the wall and he didn't implement a lot of his agenda, but border crossings were down, uh, illegal crossings were down during his four years, and the labor market tightened up considerably and wages went up. And I think that was a good thing for American workers who live here and for American citizens. And then the last is just kind of a thought experiment. It will sound crazy. You probably already think I'm crazy, so I'm not risking much by saying this. But just let, let, let yourself think, if we're really not going to control the border, and if all the things they say about immigration is true, is there a limit that you would accept? What's the upper limit? What's the upper limit to the size of the American population that we, where we finally would start to say, maybe it's getting a little crowded? Uh, and what's the, the, the lower limit? How much do you want to lower American wages as they are equalized with the rest of the world as the labor market becomes increasingly globalized. Yes, it is great for people who come from poor countries and who suffer to have their wages go up. It's less great for people who are already here to see their wages go down. At what point you know, do you think it would be fair when they kind of all leveled out and equalized across the country? I, 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 I freely admit to you know, that this comes off as somewhat selfish, but I'm absolutely happy to say that the United States should have a protected labor market that favors its own citizens and that pays better than other countries. Yeah, no here from Ben. All right, I appreciate the opportunity. I, do, I really do. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. It, it would have been great to see more students. Um, it must have been a recruiting issue. Um, but I, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to, to everyone that's here. Um, before you are four individuals, including myself, who are products of immigration. Each one of us sits here as a product of immigrant families that came to this country before. Mr. Anton is of Lebanese and Italian descent. Mr. Rosas um, is of... Mexican immigrants who came to this country. I am of German descent myself and folks that came from Georgia before that, the country. And Mr. Vargas grew up in the Philippines. If not for immigration, none of us would be sitting here, at least on this stage. As this de debate reflects, as a country, we're at a crossroads. We can either double down on restrictive immigration policies, which we've continued to do since Reagan last passed an amnesty in 1987, or we can choose to revitalize our economy with policies that make sense regarding immigration. National security will always be part of a conversation, and it's a necessary part of the conversation. But focusing that conversation on young men and women who have come in search of better jobs to this country and more stable political environments is misplaced. Immigrants represent opportunity, and they always have. 52% of the top 400 tech companies in this country are owned and founded by immigrants. And that's because immigrants are innovators. I once asked an individual who had immigrated from another country, Nicaragua, to Brazil, and then to Angola. I said, and he'd come back to Nicaragua and he'd start a business. I said, what, what was the difference? Why didn't you start your business before you left? He said, because after I'd migrated, I didn't fear anything. I believed I could do anything. And that has been the power of immigrants in this country. Immigrants drive innovation like no other in this country. And they also do other things. Immigrants commit crimes at lower rates 
the na native born citizens in this country. And immigrants, there was a lot about costs in this debate. Immigrants cost less than native born citizens of this country when it comes to public goods. In any case, I'd like to end my talk with a piece of the border wall. I brought this back from Tijuana, fell back to the earth as borders and walls do. Um, it's just a piece that sits in my office. Um, it's, it's crumbling as we speak. Somehow it got through TSA. I didn't check my bags, um, <laughs> but it did get here today. Walls fall, enduring policies that make sense last. And I do firmly believe this, that in the near future, there will be individuals, millions of them, that we invite into this country on legal work visas who will fly over the crumbling wall into this country because we demand their work, because we need them. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And finally, we'll hear closing remarks from Julio. <clears throat> Adjusting the microphone. Yes, we're going to crumbling. Two and a half minutes, I will. <laughs> Pause the game clock for microphone adjustments. So really what I want you to take away from what, what I have presented, what, what even Michael has presented, is that what we've seen at the border has not really happened in recent history. Uh, in the pictures that you saw, some of them was from the Haitian migrant camp in Del Rio, Texas, when there was about 16,000 of them underneath the International Bridge. Uh, by the time I got down there, there was about 10,000, and there were about 60 porta potties for all those thousands of people to use. Um, I bring that up because, again, I have to talk about how the system is not set up for this kind of incentive being brought by the Biden administration. HHS, which handles unaccompanied minors after they are processed and released by Border Patrol, has lost upward to around 80,000 children. They don't know where they are, they don't know who they're with, and they don't know what they're doing. Oftentimes, we find them, speaking of labor, uh, working in uh, meat processing facilities, in, in uh, automotive uh, plants, in very dangerous <laughs> jobs. And uh, they do that because they need the money to pay off their debt that they incurred from the cartels. Um, and I know that there was a lot of, uh, I remember under the Trump administration, there was a lot of hubbub about uh, child separation from their parents, and yet it seems no one cares about the increase in child labor and sex trafficking as a result of this current surge. Uh, when we talk about costs, I'm glad we also brought that up because in Yuma, Arizona, again, uh, their local hospital, which is, is, is a major hospital that is supposed to service around 130,000 people, they're in $26 million in debt currently because of the services rendered to the illegal immigrants that required and medical service. And I'm not saying we should have denied them, but what I am saying is that that has a cost, not just in monetary funds, because we're not even talking about broken bones, uh, bruises, or even severe dehydration, which I've seen. We're talking about people needing heart surgeries. We're talking about uh, uh, babies that are being born that need to be in the NICU for extended periods of time. And you know, there's so much hours in the day and there's only so many doctors. And so I can tell you that there was a uh, a cost with Americans in Yuma not receiving the care that they probably could have had that mass amount of people had come in. Uh, and just really quick, the last thing I want to say is, is that there is, a, there is a cost to both Americans and the migrants. I was told about a, an example, again in Yuma, where a mother and her children got lost uh, in the desert, and it was 100 degrees, and, there were, and they, were, they, were, they died, except for the 10-month-old baby. And the reason why the uh, Border Patrol agent was telling me, and the reason why he was so upset is because where the mother died uh, was very close to where they normally would patrol. But no one was patrolling that day because they were all pulled off the line and processing with thousands of people. So it's not just Americans who are bearing the brunt of this, it's also uh, the migrants. And I think uh, that's something that uh, de de-incentivizing people to come in this way is the humane approach. Thank you. Thank you again to our debaters. I hope that we have the results of our pre and post debate polls that we can uh, talk about. Here we can see the results. Well, not a lot of movement. Uh, however, I will, uh, at this point, as I said uh, at the beginning, that our goal, uh, of course, I think the goal of the debaters is to persuade hearts and minds. And I hope that they both continue to do that because we only find 
the best, truest answers and continuing to ask the tough questions and having open debate. So I thank you all for being a part of this debate tonight. But I also uh, don't believe that this represents any failure in terms of the debate because I hope that at least everyone listening can understand the nuances of the debate better. Even if you didn't change your perspective from agree to disagree or vice versa, you've at least been exposed to a lot of information, a lot of arguments, a lot of interesting um, pieces of the puzzle when it comes to our debate about illegal immigration, border crossings, and immigration in general. So uh, join me in thanking our panelists once again for their excellent job. Yeah. <laughs> I would just like to brief, briefly wrap up by saying, you know, it takes courage to participate in a debate. So let's have another round of applause for our debaters and our moderator for their courage. What a model of civilized debate and discourse. If only we could get the United States Congress to take some lessons from these guys. Um, I would like to say uh, thanks again to the Adolf Coors Foundation, to the Benson Center, to Bruce and Marcy Benson. I also want to address the, the, the poll results. The, these will be posted, by the way. You'll be able to see all of this on Steamboat Institute's website um, and on our YouTube channel. This will all be posted for everyone to see. So within about 72 hours, the full debate video will be on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. I hope you will uh, share it with others. We typically get tens of thousands of views of these debates after the fact, so feel free to share. I also want to point out, this was heavily marketed to the entire CU campus community. We reached out to dozens of student groups through uh, social media, through personal emails, through posting flyers all around campus. There were a multitude of ways our speakers promoted it to their networks. We ran paid ads in the Boulder Daily Camera um, and uh, really tried to reach out to the entire community. So please know that uh, we do our best to get a very broad and diverse audience, and we hope that they will watch the video after the fact and learn something from these four debaters that we were privileged to have with us tonight. So thank you again for coming. Thank you for supporting Steamboat Institute and the Benson Center. We depend on your support to, to put these programs on, on college campuses, and uh, we really appreciate your support. Thank you again to our panelists. Have a good evening.